Hello and welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Before we begin today's session of the Hindu analysis, an important announcement. Baiju's is bringing to you the National Scholarship Test, which gives you a chance to win up to 90% scholarship on all the Baiju's IAS courses. This online test will be held on 6th of February at 11 a.m. The link to register is given in the description of the video. The deadline to register is 5th of Feb till 6 p.m. in the evening. All the very best for this scholarship test. Now let's begin our analysis with the first article that talks about the recent press conference held by the army chief in which he said that out of all the flashpoints that we have had with China, only one issue remains unresolved while the others have been resolved. The author here says that this statement by the army chief has further complicated the situation. Now let's see what this article talks about. In the beginning, the author gives an example of how China in the past has used its own propaganda to highlight that India is actually invading in the Chinese land. The author says that in the 1962 war, about 190 Indian soldiers lost their life when they were fighting on the other side of the line that China claims to be the border. Now after the war ended, the Indian army as happens with every single war, went to the Chinese army requesting them to give back the bodies of the soldiers so that they could be cremated and their last rites could happen. The Chinese refused and they said that we have buried all the bodies. But when the International Red Cross Society became involved in this issue, China said, okay, we will cremate the bodies and we will give back the ashes to the Indian army. However, the interesting part is, where these bodies were buried by the Chinese, the Chinese have put up a signboard saying that this is where the bodies of Indian invaders have been buried. Interestingly, the Chinese have always called the Indian soldiers as invaders so that they can say that in the past 50-60 years, whenever the Indian soldiers were fighting on the border, they were not really protecting India. Rather, they were invading into the Chinese territory. Chinese have been using this technique for a very long time now. Rather than calling the Indian soldiers as soldiers of the Indian army, they call them the invaders. And they write it on the signboards also. So that whenever you see a historical record of that area, you might assume that they were invaders. Similarly, China right now is using the present situation to their advantage. How exactly? Recently, there was a press conference held by the Indian Army Chief General M. M. Naravane, in which he said that out of the five or six friction points, that is the points where there have been issues in Ladakh between the two sides, five have already been resolved. Now, these friction points are the Depsang Plains, the Galwan Valley, the Hot Springs area, the Gogra Springs, the North Bank of the Pangong So Lake, Kailash Range and Demchok. In other words, as per the army chief, there was only one point remaining where there are still problems between the two sides. That one point as he referred to was the Hot Springs Point or which is also called the Petroling Point 15, PP15. This is the only point that was discussed earlier when the last rounds of talks were held between India and China. Now, this indirectly means that out of these six mentioned here, all the others have already been resolved, including the issue of the Depsang Plain. This is where the author has a problem. The author is saying that the government or the army cannot say that the Depsang issue has been resolved. Because right now, if you actually see through satellite imagery, it is the Chinese who are present in large number in the Depsang plains. And if India says that issue has been resolved, then China will say, okay, we are here and it is our territory only. So India has to make sure that Depsang remains a contested territory because once we say it has been resolved, China will say, okay, now this is our territory because our soldiers are already present here. For us, our aim should be to resolve Depsang in such a way that China leaves that plain area because it is extremely important for India. This could have long-term consequences and I will tell you why. In this entire region of Ladakh, the Depsang plains are extremely important. If you can see in this very small photo given in this article, in the middle of all those high mountains that we see in Ladakh, Depsang actually is an area which is a plain area, something like this. It is a plain area in which actually a face-to-face -face battle can take place. When you see war movies or battles between India and Pakistan, when you see older movies like Border etc., 
you can see that heavy artillery such as tanks etc can only be used in a plain area so plain areas are the ones where they can be army to army combat hand to hand combat in mountainous areas you can't have a very large army facing each other that is why the depsang plains are extremely important because that is an area where either of the two sides can place a lot of weapons and a lot of people they can't do that on the mountain ranges that is why depsang is extremely important also depsang has always been a part of indian territory so now when the chinese soldiers are present there we cannot say that the issue has been resolved because if that is the case then status quo will remain and china will not leave that position which will be to the detriment of india as i said depsang is actually flat terrain located in an area which the army says sub sector north it is a land that connects to central asia also and to the karakoram pass also just a few kilometers to the north of the depsang plains is the dolat beg olti that is the highest air base that is operated by the indian air force let me show you the map also so that you become more clear about this so if you look at this particular photo this is the dolat beg olti that is the highest air base operated by the indian air force just below that would be the depsang sector or the depsang plains this is the depsang plain where this issue has still not been resolved till now now the article says that the chinese army has been blocking indian patrolling side since the early 2020 at a place called wai junction and they have not been allowed to reach up to the depsang plain now again let me show you what is the wai junction if you look at this photo this is a place called the wai junction This is very near to the Burtse camp that is operated by the Indo-Tibetan border police and to the north of it is the Depsang plains. This is where we have not been allowed to go because the Chinese soldiers have their presence here. The red line that you see here is actually the LAC. So China belongs to this side of the LAC while India belongs to the other side. This Wai junction is the point where the Chinese have been stopping the Indian army from undertaking their patrols. Now the interesting point is the author here says that this is not the first time that we have had an issue about the Depsang plain because of the st strategic location of the Depsang plains it is extremely important for both the sides to have control over it in fact the first issue for the Depsang plain came up in 2013 when there was a 22 day standoff where the chinese army had come in and the indian soldiers were not allowed to go and patrol the entire Depsang plain In 2013 there was a lot of public and media outrage and the issue was resolved diplomatically but now there has been a standoff of about 22 months since the issue started in 2020 but the depsang plain area is still out of our 100% control and still there is silence about it which is extremely disappointing from our side depsang is a said is extremely important because it is a plain area and because of the plain area the opposite army can set up a large artillery and soldier base in that area and that is why our army also is a most vulnerable in that area particularly the other problem is if you look at this area from the chinese side they have multiple roads that can provide easy access to this area and that is why we are concerned that this particular area must not be under the chinese control the other interesting point that you have to understand is if unfortunately the chinese do have the presence in the depsang area that means india's connection to the aksai chin area which is under china's control and we consider it as our territory will also be cut off so any future plans or any future hope that we could be able to get back the aksai chin area would also go down the drain if we lose access to the depsang plains also and that is why we need to understand that we can't allow this to happen the other interesting point here is that our prime minister narendra modi in june 2020 said that no one has entered the indian territory now this actually gives an upper hand to china because china would say okay now that you say no one has entered your territory that means where we are sitting is our territory only because we never entered your territory so this statement of showing that we are powerful has actually backfired as per the author because we have claimed that china never entered our territory that means wherever chinese soldiers are right now automatically becomes their territory and not ours that is a mistake that the author says has to be corrected as soon as possible and these round of talks that are going on must include the issue of the depsang plains as well 
Now, I know since these issues began, you would have seen a lot of maps and photos to understand the geography of this area. And it is extremely, extremely difficult to understand this geography. But over here, there are two other points that I would like to make here so that you understand the importance of this area. One is that in this area, to the north of the Siachen Glacier, there is an area called the Shaksgam Valley. This Shaksgam Valley is an important area. Why? Because in 1960s, Pakistan gave this area to China. Now, officially, this is our area. So how can Pakistan give it to China? But the point is that it is a part of the Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and the Pakistanis had given this area to China. Now, the connection to Shaksgam Valley and Debsang Plain is also very close geographically. So that also gives an upper hand to China. So Debsang Plain can actually become, in the worst case scenario, a place where Pakistan and Chinese army can come together against India. That is also something that we do not want. Also, I want you to understand how difficult is the geography of that area. So what I have done is I have taken certain images from Google Earth so that you understand how tough this area is. Now, if you look at this image for now, number one, this red line that you see is actually the LAC, line of actual control considered as the border between the two sides. Now, as you can see, this is not a plain area. This line is going in between a mountain, going down and then again going up a mountain range. So this is how difficult it is to mark the border area between the two sides. This is not a plain area. These are the areas which have high mountains and even those mountains are divided into two parts because of these lines that we call the LAC. This river that you see is the Galwan River. This valley as you can see, as you know, valley means the low point between mountains. So this valley, as you see, is the Galwan Valley over here. And this river going through this valley is called the Galwan River. This is the approximate location of where the clash took place between the Indian and the Chinese army soldiers in June 2020, where multiple soldiers from the Indian sides were martyred. So as you can see, the geography of this area is extremely complex and extremely difficult not just for someone sitting far away to understand, but also for people over there who are defending our borders. The next article that we have talks about the case of Meghalaya government's COVID-19 relief package and how exactly has this package become a part of a large controversy in the state of Meghalaya. Now, just like many other states, Meghalaya state also organized a COVID-19 relief package mainly focusing on the unorganized sectors for the workers who had lost their job and did not have any social security. As we know, the unorganized workers were the worst hit when the COVID-19 pandemic started. In fact, the Oxfam inequality report said that while billionaires in India grew their wealth during pandemic, 84% people in India had to suffer from reduced income, while 4.6 crore working people slipped into situation of acute poverty. In all this background, the Meghalaya government announced that we are bringing a COVID-19 lockdown relief package that will be sponsored by Chief Minister's Relief Against Wage Loss Scheme. Now, the interesting part was when this scheme was announced, there was absolutely no detail given by the government. The government did not say who are eligible under this scheme. The government did not say how much money will you be getting. The government did not publicize the scheme. There were no guidelines for identifying who are the people eligible under the scheme. The only thing that the government did was they just announced the scheme so that they could get all the TRP, they could get all the applause so that they can say we did a lot of things because announcing a scheme is the easiest way to get into the good books of the media and of the people. But there were no details given. So even though there were no details given, people thought something is better than nothing. So lakhs of people applied, filled up the forms so that they could get some money from the government. But again, because no one knew what is the eligibility criteria, everyone started to apply. Because there was no eligibility criteria, no one was sure will they get the money or not. They could not even check whether their application was successful or not. So everyone was just waiting like it was a climax of a reality show that you never know who the winner would be. Finally, after a few months, a few people started getting some money from the government side in their bank account. But again, the money that they were getting was very different from each other. Then finally, in October 2020, an RTI was filed by a local civil group in Meghale. The response came in December 2020. The response was the government said that about 1,60,000 people have been identified and we have transferred money to them. 
and how much money have we transferred the government said that we are giving 2100 rupees as financial assistance to those people who worked as unorganized labor and had to lose their job during the pandemic also we are targeting construction workers so those construction workers who are registered under the building and other construction workers act of the government they were getting 5000 rupees from the meghalaya government this was a long reply having a detail of 160000 people so what this civil group did was they converted that reply of the government into a digital database so that you can come and search your name whether or not my name is in that list or not so what happened was people started searching their names many people said my name is in the database but i did not get any money this ngo started making calls to people that your name is in the database did you get the money or not and finally it was found out that only 13 percent people out of the people who had received the call from the civil society only 13 percent people said that they actually got the money from the government that was mentioned in the rti response 47 percent people said we did not get any money and remaining 50 percent said that they got some small random amounts meaning that there was no accountability and no transparency in the entire process when the government was asked questions they refused to accept or engage in any of the findings thus multiple civil society groups got together and recently organized a big public hearing in shillong on the world human rights day this public hearing was presided over by a retired supreme court judge government was also invited to keep their point of view but no one came from the government the department of labor from the government of meghale boycotted the public hearing and did not send anyone to keep the side of the government now because the government is not responding the civil society groups have now approached the legal services authority as you know under the nalsa act there is a legal services authority at every district and at the state level as well to ensure that legal aid is provided to the people free of cost and other legal helps are offered to the people so these civil society groups have now approached the legal services authority to enforce this grievance redressal mechanism now although this article and this entire case study is focused on meghalaya because the rti was filed there the authors say that other states also will be found guilty if we conduct a proper audit into these covid-19 relief schemes we have seen multiple media reports where it was shown that despite the schools being closed funds were taken out of the midday meal program there were no students coming to school there were no meals served to them but still in the government records the money was being spent and the authors say that this transparency must be ensured at all the governments and not just meghale various state governments and the center government in the past couple of years have collected and spent thousands of crores of rupees in the name of covid-19 relief they have used money from different funds including the district mineral foundation trust fund the disaster relief fund the campa funds etc in the name of relief payments but there has not been any audit conducted on these funds by the cag and it is time that questions are asked by the civil society and by the common public after meghale the same is also being done in rajasthan and other people in the other states should also take a cue from this now this is not the first time or the last time unfortunately that such a scam or such a problematic figure has come out from the government side now there is one very interesting trend that you must acknowledge here there have been multiple such agitations in the northeast part of the country and most of them are actually led by amazing women northeast part of india actually has a history of women led protests which have given great results for example this protest also was actually launched by a women this local civil society group that first filed the rti in 2020 october is run by a women these are some of the examples this lady that you see here is angela rangad she is the one who runs this civil society group that filed the rti against the meghalaya government as you can see in the photo she is the one who sat alone outside the meghalaya secretariat for about 10 days in the month of july forcing the meghalaya government to invite her inside and listen to what her demands were she was the one who was demanding that there should be transparency in government's working her demand was that the government should not steal people's money i am sure you are also familiar with iram sharmila called the iron lady of manipur 
she was on a fast for many many years with her demand that afspa should be repealed from manipur and other states of the northeast the photo that you see here is of the members of the assam mahila samiti who have worked for many years to encourage women's self esteem in the society and have done great work in creating awareness against witch hunting witch hunting as you know is a social evil under which it is assumed that a witch has taken over your body and the women in return are either tied to a tree or they are later on killed just because the people think that getting rid of this lady would lead to getting rid of the witch these women that you see have been working against that evil in the society and there are many many other examples northeast as you know has always been a matrilineal society where women have taken a lead in many of these protests and this is an extremely encouraging sign for the other states in india as well The next article that we have talks about India's announcement about a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Olympics that will begin today itself. India is not the first country to announce such a diplomatic boycott of the Winter Games in China. Western nations starting with US and many other European countries also have announced that they will be diplomatically boycotting these Winter Olympics. Now there are different reasons why these countries have decided to do so. Also understand diplomatic boycott does not mean that the players will not participate in fact in the winter olympics india has only one single athlete that will be representing our country that is the skier arif khan he will take part in the games opening and the closing ceremony along with the support staff but this diplomatic boycott means that india will not send any official representative from the indian government side now the reason why india has taken this stand despite being supportive of china earlier is because china decided to choose a pla commander as one of the participants in the torch relay of the opening ceremony this pla commander specifically was involved in the galwan clashes that led to soldiers from both the sides losing their life after many many years in fact this pla commander was also given military honors by beijing a few months back this indicates the fact that china wants to publicize what happened in galwan and wants to highlight the bravery of the pla troops interestingly it comes on the same day when you have a lot of international media reports coming in saying that china actually lost over 40 soldiers in the galwan clash while china has only accepted that four of their soldiers lost their life an australian media agency has reported that close to 40 of chinese soldiers were actually killed on that day now while india announced a diplomatic boycott because of these reasons nations such as the US and other european nations had already announced a similar boycott because of china's questionable human rights record specifically with respect to their xinjiang region the interesting part also is that india in november had actually joined russia in supporting china and the organization of the games in china when we had a meeting of foreign ministers of russia india and china coming together but this act by china of involving the pla commander into the torch relay race has actually offset all those talks that india had made earlier with respect to the winter games it is to be noted that when the western countries announced this diplomatic boycott the chinese response was that we should not mix politics with games but china's decision to include this army commander is nothing but involvement of politics in these games and that is why china is not following what it is preaching to the entire world Earlier as I said the US government decided not to send any official representative to the Winter Olympic Games saying that they would observe a diplomatic boycott. This is mainly with respect to China's gross human rights abuse record and atrocities that it is indulging in in the Xinjiang region where the Uyghur Muslim population resides. The entire world is aware how the Xinjiang Uyghurs have been mistreated by the Chinese authorities and have been forced to live in detention camps. The Chinese authorities first said that these are not detention but re-education camps and we are giving them skills so that they can get better jobs in China. However, later on China denied the existence of those camps but when pressurized they said that these centers were actually vocational training centers. So they have changed their stand every few months whenever they have been asked about this. Apart from US the other countries who have announced a diplomatic boycott of the winter olympic games include australia canada and new zealand do remember that these decisions of the nations do not impact the participation of the athletes from any of their nations it is only about official representation to these games 
Interestingly, Russia under Vladimir Putin is in complete support of China. He, along with the leaders of the Central Asian nations, are expected to be present at the opening ceremony of these Winter Olympic Games. Winter Olympics is not something that we are very familiar with in India. It comprises of sports that are mainly played on ice or snow. Just like the Common Olympics, it is also held every four years and participants from across the world gather at one single place to take part in competitions such as ice skating, ice hockey, skiing, figure skating, etc. The first of these games were held in France in 1924. The winter sports were initially a part of the Summer Olympics only in 1908 London Olympics. However, it was in 1924 that a separate event was created for the winter sports. As far as India is concerned, we have been participating in the Winter Olympics since 1964. However, India has not won any medal at the Winter Olympics till now. The next news article is about the government's proposal to put 30% taxes on cryptocurrency and other virtual assets as a part of the announcements during this budget. Out of the announcements that made the news across the country was the taxation proposal for virtual digital assets. When the finance minister proposed tax on the profits of the transactions in such assets by 30%, along with the other applicable surcharge and CES. Apart from that, 1% tax will be deducted by the buyer while trading in any virtual digital asset so that the government can track who is buying it and who is selling it. Also, no deductions will be allowed to offset your losses. The interesting part is, even if you receive a cryptocurrency, let's say a Bitcoin, as a gift from anyone, even then it will be taxable except when you receive it from your relatives. So for example, if it's your birthday, your girlfriend or your boyfriend is very happy with you and they gift you one Bitcoin, even then the government will take 30% of the tax from that Bitcoin transaction. Now the interesting point is India till now has not given any legal authority to the Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency for that matter. The finance minister also clarified that just by imposing tax, we are not saying that it is legitimate, now, which is pretty interesting. The government is saying that this is not legal or not illegal. We are thinking about it. But while we are thinking about it, let's at least collect taxes from it so that we can at least gain from one end. Now, this is seen as a positive sign for those people who are dealing in crypto in India because once the government starts putting taxes on it, there's a greater chance that in the coming times, the government will recognize this or at least the government will not say that it is illegal to trade in cryptocurrency. The article says that it is high time that the government takes a call because this is a technology of the coming years. Any delay in arriving at a decision about legality or illegality of cryptocurrency is only delaying the development of technology in India and is stopping startups and innovators who want to work in this area. In November, the government indicated a forward-looking approach towards the crypto market but not giving it a legal standing or at least saying that it is not illegal is only hurting the development of this technology in India. Now, cryptocurrency is such a new topic right now that different nations around the world are at different stages with respect to cryptocurrency. Some are taxing it, some have legalized it, while some other governments have been keeping away from it. Let me give you a few examples. In US, for example, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network which is at the forefront of regulation of cryptocurrency, issued a guidance on regulating these cryptocurrencies, thus bringing them under the ambit of the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970. The IRS, that is an equivalent of income tax department in the US, said that cryptocurrencies are treated as property for the purpose of federal tax. Germany, in fact, is one of those nations that has formally recognized bitcoins, as a unit of account, allowing them to be used for tax and even for private traded purposes. In UK, cryptos are classified as an asset or private money on which capital gain tax is applicable, but VAT, that is value added tax, is exempted. In Australia, these currencies were considered intangible property earlier, but now they come under the GST regime. While these nations have shown a positive attitude towards cryptocurrency, China is on the other end of the spectrum where the government has taken aggressive steps against digital currency. The People's Bank of China conducted on-site inspections of Bitcoin exchanges and plans to import penalties on these exchanges for violating the upgraded norms relating to anti-money laundering in the country. As far as India is concerned, the Finance Bill 2022 for the first time 
defined the concept of crypto assets. As per the definition, any information or code or number or token generated through cryptographic means or otherwise providing a digital representation of value exchange with or without consideration that can be transferred, stored or traded electronically can be defined as virtual digital asset. Whew, that's a long definition. Essentially, the finance bill has provided the definition of this and most probably accepting this in the country will be the next step forward. The next important news article in today's paper is about the need to increase the labor income in the country and to focus on consumption expenditure as well. The article revolves around the fact that in the recent announcement of the budget, what the government has done is they have cut down budget allocations from many important schemes through which we could have hoped that money will go into the hands of the labor class. Because there is lesser money in the hands of the labor class now, they are consuming much lesser as compared to earlier and the economy is slowing down. Now, before I go into detail of this article, there are two concepts which many of you would know. Otherwise, let me revise them with you. First is called BE or budget estimates. And the second is called RE, that is the revised estimates. Let's take an example of how it works. Let's assume in last year's budget, not this one, in last year's budget, the government would have said that we expect that in Manrega we will spend 1 lakh crore rupees. Now the financial year ends at 31st of March. So the government said last year that by 31st March 2022, we expect that 1 lakh crore rupees will be spent for Manrega. Now let's assume in the second half of 2021, a lot of people lost their jobs. So a lot more people applied for Manrega. So government had to pay more wages under Manrega. So government, instead of this plan of 1 lakh crore rupees, has already spent 1.2 lakh crore rupees on Manrega. And there is still more than one month to go till the financial year ends. Now, when the government is giving this year's budget, that is the budget that was recently announced in 2022, government will give a revised estimate of Manrega. That is, our earlier estimate in the budget was that we will spend 1 lakh crore rupees last year in Manrega. But our revised estimate is, now we are estimating that we will spend 1.5 lakh crore rupees by the end of the financial year. So in other words, budget estimate is the estimate that you expect you will be spending in the next one year. Revised estimate is that you have now revised it and now you think that just one or two months are remaining. So the amount of money that we will spend is higher or lower. So revised estimate is given in this year's budget about the change expenditure pattern that we have. So I hope that it is clear to you. Now this year's budget has projected that there will be a fiscal deficit of 6.4%. Fiscal deficit is something that we have discussed multiple times earlier. That means the expenditure of the government is more than its earning. So it is 6.4% of the GDP. The government also said that for last year, their revised estimate of fiscal deficit is 6.9%. So we will end the last financial year on 31st March with a 6.9% fiscal deficit for last year. Now everyone knows that we are going through a period of economic crisis due to multiple reasons. India right now is facing a sharp reduction in the labor income. Many people have lost their jobs due to pandemic. Those who have not lost their jobs have seen a major cut in their salary during the pandemic. It has also led to a sharp fall in the consumption to GDP ratio. Obviously, because people are earning lesser money, they are consuming lesser things. So there is a shortfall of demand in the market right now. In fact, consumption expenditure, that is, the money that we spend in the market to consume stuff is much lower even as compared to 2019-20. Thus, there are multiple challenges. First challenge, we need policies that boost labor income and consumption expenditure. Secondly, we need to remove obstacles that are stopping the Indian economy from growing. Because even before the pandemic, we were in a situation where the economy was not going very well. So it is not that only the pandemic has hurt our economy. Our economy was in a slowdown even before the pandemic, so we have to address that as well. The article, however, says that the government has not addressed these challenges at all, which is pretty disappointing. Now, let's look into the analysis of what the author is saying. The author is saying there are multiple ways in which the government gets money. 
one way in which the government gets money is from our taxes the other way in which the government gets its money is non debt receipt like the income from the companies like lic rbi etc the third way that the government gets money is debt now as per the budget the government is saying that we don't expect much higher taxes as compared to last year we don't expect much higher non debt receipt as compared to last year and we are also reducing our debt as compared to last year so when we are reducing every single thing that means eventually what will happen the expenditure of the government will reduce simple but if your income is reducing with every single source then at the end of the day you will obviously reduce your expenditure only now there are two types of expenditures right we discuss about this there is capital expenditure and there is revenue expenditure capital expenditure means expenditure that is made in building infrastructure bridges roads airports etc government has been announcing that we are increasing our capital expenditure the capex has been increased we are building a lot more highways infrastructure etc that means in short it is a revenue expenditure that will be cut down all the income is coming down but the capital expenditure is going up so the only way for this mathematical equation to be true is that revenue expenditure will come down revenue expenditure means the expenditure that the government is making on subsidies salaries manrega etc direct benefit cash transfers that the government makes any expenditure against which we are not making any infrastructure that is revenue expenditure so means revenue expenditure is going down which obviously means that the labor income will short fall in the coming year because subsidies are being cut there will obviously be a reduction in the social sector expenditure the other thing that we have to understand is during pandemic most of the corporates increase their profit by firing people however even then the corporate tax to gdp ratio has continued to remain low even though they are earning more taxes corporates are not paying more taxes why because they have been given a lot of tax concessions and the government is ignoring that part now when the government reduces the development spending obviously there are many negative implications because of lack of development spending government will be able to give lesser food subsidies lesser money for schemes such as manrega lesser expenditure on agriculture social sector etc which means that our actual gdp growth in the coming 4 or 5 years will actually remain lower as compared to what we have projected even in the last 4 years our own growth estimate that the government gave in economic survey we have never been able to meet that it seems that this year also will remain the same the government is hoping that our economic recovery will be driven by external demand we will be able to export more stuff but that does not seem to be happening and there are no positive signs in that regard thus the government must understand while capital expenditure is important ignoring revenue expenditure will leave no money in the hands of the labor class which will be detrimental to the economy now there are some examples which i can share with you about how the schemes have been getting lower money as compared to the last year let's take an example of a few schemes there is the integrated child development services which is now a part of the saksham anganwadi and poshan 2.0 which aims to provide basic education health and nutrition service to early childhood development this scheme only got 52% of its budget till december i am talking about last year's budget so till december means only 3 months were left in the financial year to get over and they only got 52% of their budget similarly only 48% of the budget was given to mid day meal program till december with only 3 months remaining in the financial year to end and this year's budget is no better in fact this year's budget has given 11% lower budget as compared to last year to mid day meals similarly the saksham anganwadi and poshan 2.0 locations have remained lower as compared to the last year's budget estimates similarly lower funds have been allocated to the food corporation of india which is an indication that the food subsidy will go down and will only increase the debt burden of the food corporation of india not just this manrega also which directly puts money in the hands of the people has seen an allocation cut of 25% as compared to the revised estimates of where we will end the last financial year all these taken collectively are not positive signs and the author warns the government to focus on putting more money in the hands of especially the lower class and increasing their consumption expenditure these were the articles we wanted to discuss today a couple of practice questions now number 1 
considering the recent spat of incident at the border is india right in announcing a diplomatic boycott of the winter olympics to be held in china second describe the short term and long term consequences of increased consumption expenditure on the indian economy both the questions have to be answered within 250 words each thank you so much for watching the video